let's go. Megan Giddings, well, first of all, Megan Giddings is an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota. Her first novel, Lakewood, was one of New York Magazine's top 10 books of 2020, an NPR best book of 2020, a Michigan notable book for 2021, my goodness, a finalist for two NAACP Image Awards, and was a finalist for the LA Times Book Prize in the Ray Bradbury Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Speculative category. Tonight, we're recording live at Majors and Quinn Booksellers in Minneapolis, celebrating the launch of the, her latest novel, The Women Could Fly. Audience, please join me in welcoming none other than the author, Megan Gaines. One of my favorite things to do is to say, welcome, Megan, to Black Market Reads. Thank you for having me, and thanks, everybody, for coming. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your Tuesday night to be here. Oh, I'm so excited, and I'm so glad you're here. All right, let's get it going, because they want to hear from you. First of all, I read your book, and I couldn't put it down. Edie sent it to me, I picked it up, I came over, and then I grabbed it, and I told my husband I won't be back for the weekend, but I <laughs> want to first get to know a little bit more about you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you want us to know? And why do you write, Megan? You know, the, the first question always makes me clam up because I never <laughs> think of like what I want people to know about me. But I think why I write is because some of it is I just can't help it. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you are writers in the room and you've always written. It's always been the way you express yourself. So it's hard for me to find a way to like divorce or think of a time in my life where I didn't write. I still have journals from when I was a child. I, they're kind of dumb because I, I mean, kids, kids are wild. And the things I'm saying, they're often just either recaps of books I read or I'm really obsessed with cows for a little bit. It's really weird. <laughs> so it's not like these great literary artifacts that I have. But I also have been thinking a lot about why I write now because and I, I think it's a lot of what everybody's thinking about. Like, why do we make art right now? Why do we, why do we care so much about books when the world is on fire? I mean, literally this summer. And I think it's because it's the most human thing I can think of. People like making things. And there's something really reassuring right now about reminding myself that I'm a person, that I'm connected to other people. And that's part of writing for me. Hmm. You still have your journals from when you were a child. That is so amazing to me. I wonder if one day someone's going to turn those into some magnificent story about you. Oh, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well then, the women could fly. Yeah, let's talk about let's it. Let's talk about it. What do you want our audience to know about your book? So, I, I started writing in 2018, and... It's about a mother and daughter relationship. It's about gender oppression. It's also funny. And it's also about witches, and it's about the Midwest. And I think in some ways, it's a lot about being a black woman in the Midwest as well. Um, what else can I tell you? Um, you'll have to give up your weekend because you won't be able to put it down. That's perfect. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now for the biggest treat. Will you read? Yeah, I'm gonna read this I'm gonna read twice tonight. And the first time I'm gonna read from the first chapter. I would read later, but I've been told that I should stick to the first five chapters so I don't give too much away. Mm -hmm. Oh. So and, and that's also to tell all of you that there is a big twist in the middle. So if you read the book, you'll get to talk the twist. Alright, so this is Chapter one, page one. On the day we all agreed that yes, sure, okay, it's time, my mother was dead. I went to the storage unit where my father kept all his stuff. I told myself if I wanted, I could burn it. Take all the boxes and clothes and love things out into the parking lot. Kerosene, matches, patience, ash. Instead, I decided I would sort through it, choose a few things to save, clean the rest out, and save my dad some time and money. I'm a practical person. The unit smelled like black and mild jazzes, but I wasn't sure why. There were faint whiffs of her when I opened different boxes. Cedar, mint, rosemary. I want to be precise because every time I'm precise about her, she returns for a half second. 
her hand on the fork and spoon in a way where I can see the dirt beneath her fingernails. Saturday mornings that she spent spread out on the sofa, legs crossed and eyes on the ceiling, a forgotten book on her stomach. My mother's hand on my forearm, her skin shining brown and telling me I need to get lotion. She will not have her child walking around ashy. Her fingers pushing my hair away from my eyebrows and saying, just because your forehead is big doesn't mean it isn't beautiful. Look, there you are. I say it aloud again. Yes, sure, she is definitely, no, definitely dead. Say it again like you believe it. My mother is dead. My voice looks black yet hesitant. A box mark, hip hair, pomade, flat iron, a wig I had never seen her wear, synthetic smell, her books and research. My mother's biggest passion was researching our lineage. My great, 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 great granddad, I always mess that one up because I put too many great. <laughs> was burned for witchcraft. Birds that stilled, eyes that grew bright, their beaks and feathers following her, she spoke, or refusal to take a husband. The accounts about her disagreed. The story my mother preferred. Our ancestor was just an ordinary woman, an ordinary woman in the wrong place to upset the wrong man and he used the laws of the day to teach her and all the other women in her village a lesson. Not a fun story, but an honest one. In the story my father, my grandmother, my aunt, everyone else in my life prefers to tell, my ancestor was a witch. Her burning took place on a beach, the heat from the fire so hot it turned sand into glass. My grandma has a bracelet made from the beach she swears came from that day. It had been passed on from eldest daughter to eldest daughter. Our ancestress, when she couldn't handle the fire any longer, flew off the pillar and plunged her scorched feet into the sea. The smoke and steam sifted and became a week-long fog. The crashed ship, the blanket of the town, made the people who had tried to burn her afraid to leave their homes. My grandmother's records say this ancestor went to the United States. Her older sister's records say this happened on Oak Island in South Carolina. And my other great aunt says, no, this was New York. Now I'm gonna stop right there so we can keep talking. Megan Giddings reading from her latest novel, The Women Could Fly. This is Black Market Reads, and I'm your host, Lissa Jones, coming to you from Majors and Quinn Booksellers in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Megan, I have a few questions. Let's wrap a minute, and then we'll let the audience get in on it. Okay. Ashy. If you're black, you probably know what that means. If yeah. you're not black, what does ashy mean? Because <laughs> you do not want to be black and be caught ashy. <laughs> You are not taking care of yourself. You, your parent, your, most of the time for me, it was literally your skin is so dry that my dad would be like, no, 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 go back inside. Like that's directly a quote from my dad just to tell me the book. <laughs> okay, so this idea of being ashy is the idea yeah. that the melanin in our skin requires lotion. Yeah. And so if a person with a lot of melanin in their skin doesn't lotion, your hand looks like a dry beach. Mm -hmm. It looks very sandy. And for your parents, it's very embarrassing because it means you're not well kept up. And yeah. so if you are ashy, you are sent right back in the house to get lotion and get yourself together. So that cultural reference is not something that everybody understands. And many times when I'm reading, I end up using the dictionary so that I can really understand the way the author intended me to understand it. So I thought that cultural reference was important. Let's talk about growing up as a person of culture um, in Michigan. Okay. One of very few families. Yeah. How does that inform your writing? How did that shape you? I think that it shapes it. I mean, both of my books feature characters who either go into a predominantly white space or were born in one. I think my third book is going to be the only book that doesn't feature that. We'll find out. <laughs> um, but I think, I think it adds a sense to all of the characters that I write of being monitored or hyper aware of how people are perceiving them. And that's, that's how I grew up. I was hyper aware, and some of it, you and I had talked before, and some of it was my parents worried about things like that. And some of it was, like when you grow up in a rural town and you're the only black person these people have ever met, you, you kind of become this ambassador sometimes, it feels like, where you feel like people, especially kids, will ask you questions. I don't know why I'm like doing the distance here of where it was, like the situation where kids would ask me questions like, do black people like this? Do black people like that? <laughs> sometimes it was well-meaning and sometimes it was very offensive. And I, I 
think a lot about how identity shifts depending on who's comfortable with it or who is willing to see you as this kind of person too. Mm -hmm. Race dehumanizes. It makes people forget that we have to eat and we have to sleep and we have to shower and we have to put on clothes just like everybody else, but somehow black. Yeah. It makes us like a foreigner. Being a black woman in the Midwest, you talk about it a lot, and it's a certain kind of thing to be a black woman in the Midwest. Tell us about it. I think you simultaneously have like all the Midwestern kindness where, I don't know, if I see a younger black woman and she's in trouble, I immediately notice. <laughs> and it's becoming even more and more pronounced as I age. But I think you also have even more of the Midwestern reservedness because, again, you're always sussing people out a little bit. So once you become family, you're family for forever, but it takes so long. <laughs> I don't know, it takes a lot for people to get under my skin now. Mm. Because you're older? Because I'm older, because I've experienced, I mean, I've lived in Indiana, I've lived in Michigan, you just feel a lot of distance. A lot of othering. A lot of othering. What is it about black women, do you think, that people always want to rearrange? That they just can't leave well enough alone? That they need to just, you know, tweak us around the edges or ask us to conform or, you know, require our compliance? What do you think is behind the compulsion for people to always want to rearrange black women? I, I don't think that there's any neutral for people. I think people see black women in extremes. I think we're either hypersexualized most of the time, or <laughs> we're not seen at all as desirable. And when you shift paradigms and never see someone as just like a neutral person, I, I think you get to see a lot of how other people feel comfortable acting when they don't see you as a neutral person, as they only can see your body, you can only see your skin. Invisibility and visibility. At the same time. At the yeah. same time. Hmm. Lake Superior. Why Lake Superior? Oh, because it's the most beautiful of the lakes and the scariest of the lakes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you mean by so scary? many shipwrecks? I mean, I grew up oh. hearing about all the shipwrecks or how cold it gets. I feel, doesn't they have the most shipwrecks out of all the Great Lakes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't know. <laughs> I'm just sitting with the thinking, hmm, okay, all right. You know, things just come to you over time. Women's bodies and taking control. If you're not married by the time you're 30, you need to sign up for the registry. And when you sign up for the registry, you need to give up your autonomy. We are very, very close, post Roe v. Wade, we're very, very close to registries if we're not already there. What caused you to see that that was possible? What caused you to envision that this could be real? I mean, it's, some of it is just woven into the history of our country. I, I mean, we just lost Roe, and I'm very sensitive about that fact. But we only had it for how many years? 50? We, women couldn't have credit cards unless they were married and had a husband's permission. And wasn't that, we only had, we've only had 50 years of that so far. Not that credit cards are like this great thing, but you still need some form of financial independence. Or even right now in Missouri, you can't get a divorce if you're pregnant. And I, I think a lot of times in this country, we we've really made some stories about the ways women are, are oppressed that's normal. Or we treat sometimes, we treat sometimes like it's cute. Like I, I briefly lived in this town in Ohio and one of the first stories people told me is that there were no sorority houses, there was a college town and I was getting my MA there. And they told me that on the books was a law that no more than four women could live together. And it was treated like this cute story but it was tried to brothel laws, where if more than four women lived together in a house and they weren't related, it was a whorehouse. Mm. 
and people would treat this like a very cute story about the town, like, this is funny, or this is weird, but it was also a house of, it was also a town that was filled with fraternities, and notorious for, like, fraternities that did hazing, and it was just these layers of, who, who gets to make mistakes? I mean, when you can't even have, you can't have, like, four best friends live with you in college, which is what saves some money on rent. But people thought that was just like a funny, cute story. And to me, I was like, what? But I heard the story a lot from people who were just used to the town. It was like, it was flavor. It was like nothing. It was like nothing. What do you think happens that every person in the universe has to come by a woman and then somehow they come out and somehow now we're anti-women and we want to repress women and we want to control their magic? What happens in the middle? I, I think it's just that normalizing. We, we treat it like a thing where if no one says anything, let's make a cute story about it. Let's just say this is the way we live. And I, I think that's human nature. If enough people accept something, the average person says, okay, I guess I've got to accept this to be in the community, even when often the community is wrong. If, if the community isn't taking care of everybody, it's wrong. We, we need to be there for each other. We need to make space for one another. Speaking of making space for one another, the beautiful place, albeit very, very complicated, beauty being a very complex word in this case, to describe the place where the women have gone, and maybe a few men, <laughs> but the energy is different. Yeah. It's almost separated from the broken community. Mm -hmm but it's the love of women. Yeah. Is that what you meant to communicate? The complexity of love of women? And I think that it was almost, I wanted to put the love of women first, but I wanted to also put, because I wanted to make sure that there was room for many different kinds of people there, where there's an emphasis that some of the characters are non-binary there, some of the characters are trans or men, but I wanted to envision a space in the book where you could just be in community with one another. And the, the overwhelming was like a love for one another or a love for this space. Okay, before we have another reading, black women have always been magic. I don't know why the world's just getting hit lately, but we've always been magic. But you really center on black women and magic. You don't really have need, like Toni Morrison, to look through the white gaze. You look and center on black women without apology. Why and how? I, I think it was a reaction to my first book, where my first book was really centered on the white gaze. And a lot of the questions I got during that tour were like, well, why, why, why did you approach that? And I, I started asking myself, because I, I have a clear reason for why I did that in Lakewood, because it was about research studies. And it was, like, you, you can't really write a book that's about like American research studies without bringing in the white gaze oh, right. or writing about medicine and how it's impacted black communities unless you make it like hyper speculative. And for this book I wanted to think about well what is what what would like what would that look like? And it's something that seems so logical but still felt radical with the way publishing is. And I was really surprised when we went out with the book that so many people were enthusiastic about it. Like no one was very enthusiastic about my first book. I'm not ashamed of that, but it's just how it is. And then with my second book, even though I felt like only a few people would want it because it is just not really about race relations. And so many of the notes I've gotten about the first book where they wanted to be even more about race or they wanted me to define whether or not it was a black story or an adventure story or this. So it was also kind of this interesting thing that happened that the book I didn't think people would really be that interested in became the book that people became very interested in when it was mostly about black women. I think, you know, to be told, I think people are very curious about black people. I think they don't really understand how we live, <laughs> you know, um, like we actually live like you do a lot of times, but we do have our own way of living. And I think about 
how black women have to show up in multiple ways, how we are always uh, forced to have to show up differently in different situations. Were the characters that you represented in all the different scopes and shapes of women mm -hmm. supposed to be representative of that, the way that black women have to twist and... It was some of that, and also I was thinking about how often women do have to kind of be actresses still. Mm -hmm. Where, um, what is it? I think it's called The Last Movie Stars. I was watching some of it over the weekend. It's a mini series on HBO. Ethan Hawke did it. It's about Paul Newman and Joanne and, Woodward. Yeah, Joanne Woodward. And Ethan Hawke said, he said in this thing that it was just profound. And it was profound to hear like a man still say it that women of the time, they, they had less hang ups about acting because any time they went in public, they were acting. But when I was thinking about that, I was like, has that changed really? Has that, have, have we really shifted that far where people think that women still don't feel like they have to act sometimes when they're in public just to be a little safer depending on if they're alone or where they are in the country or even if they're with another friend. It, it's a complicated thing still. And I was thinking just about how some of that really related to this book, even though I hadn't really articulated that while I was writing it. Hmm. I'm so glad, Megan, <laughs> that you came to Minnesota so we could have this talk. I'm really glad I got to meet you. I am so glad. Thank you. Will you read for us again? Yeah. Thank you. So, in the book, and I'm jumping ahead to chapter four, but there, there are folk tales woven throughout the book that Josephine's mother has told her, and I'm gonna read you all one of the folk tales from the book. It's short, but it'll be fun to read. When I was a child, my mother used to tell me a story she called The Witch in the Garden of Life. Once upon a time, there was a woman a witch loved very much. For her beloved, the witch created a garden. Every tree flourished with fruit, golden berries for knowledge, ruby melons for fulfillment, onyx apples for respite, sapphire persimmons for passion. And when the garden was in full bloom, the witch led her beloved out among the soft grasses and through the hedges. Most people will be able to eat only one kind of fruit, the witch said, some two, some none. But the chosen fruit shows their heart's truest desire. Choose your life. The witch guessed it at the multicolored abundance, her face glowing with the pride of knowing she alone had made all this. The lover walked around. Each fruit had its own wonderful perfume, but she couldn't choose a single one. Even the bees, the birds, the wind could choose, and the thought made her miserable. When the witch's back was turned, she went back into their cottage, shut at all the windows, and sat in the dim firelight. It was better when making a decision the woman vowed to see only the shape of things. When I heard this story, it had a different ending. The witch and the woman weren't lovers, but just good, good friends. Choose your life, the witch said in each version. The best friend walked around. She stopped and smelled each fruit and settled on amethyst grapes. They would mean a happy marriage, a house filled with children, a comfortable life. This is how my mother ended the story the last time she told it. After reflecting in the darkness for three days, the lover woke up on the fourth day filled with certainty. She rummaged through the witch's pantry, overturning jars of herbs and black as night cauldrons, until she found a small sack of seeds. The woman took them outside, dug at the earth with her nails and fingers until they bled. Her fingernails cracked. She wheezed and sighed and sweated. But when the lover was done, she planned her own row. There could be grapes, there could be flowers, there could be thorns. It didn't matter. Whatever bloomed was hers. That was Megan Giddings reading from her latest novel, The Women Could Fly. I'm your host, Lissa Jones, and this is Black Market Reads. We're here at Majors and Queen Booksellers. Okay, it's your turn, beauties. Do you have some burning, articulate questions you'd like to toast to Megan? Because now's the time. She's here in the flesh, and you can ask her anything you'd like to know. And she'll tell you whether she'll tell you or not, because she's full of agency. <laughs> she can fly. <laughs> 
Yes, the wonderful black storyteller. Beautiful Beverly Kaufman. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome. Welcome Hi. to Minneapolis. Uh, my name is Beverly, and I am in a book club, and our book club has been together for 30 years. Oh, wow. Wow. So we've read everything. It is my turn to pick the book. Why should I pick yours? Beverly. <laughs> 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 Because I would stop by your book club oh. to talk with you all because I live in town now. Pick it, pick it. I think she just. <laughs> we like, we do like to, we do like to entertain authors. We really do. So that's was, great. Okay. <laughs> I think you just sold a book club worth of books. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, back here, Edie. Somebody to the left will get it. Megan, thank you for coming. Um, have you ever been to the w Michigan Women's Music Festival? And if you have, did it influence you? I have not, but I'm just, I feel like a generation too young Maybe. for it. But mm -hmm. I remember it a lot growing up, and it was called Women's Fest with a Y, right? I'm sorry, say again. Was it Women's Fest with a Y and then it changed names? With a, yes, with a Y. Yeah. It was it was a pop up women's community that was magic in its own right. It, and it went on for um, seven or eight days. And it was camping and it would it would um, just pop up in near Hart, Michigan, in the middle of the of, uh, of Michigan. Music and and nudity and <laughs> beauty, and, <laughs> and it was spectacular. Um, but I, I, I wish you could have uh, been part of it, but I think you recreated what, uh, what was there. Well, thank you. Two pickups. Oh, uh, um, oh. Just yeah, just please. I, I. Uh, I've, got a, I've got a couple just quick questions. Okay. Uh, what, what has kept you um, in in the Midwest as, as, as a black woman and uh, can I buy your book here at Majors and Quinn today? Good yes, job. Yes, can. I can? <laughs> yes. Everybody here can buy my book. Yeah. And you can have it signed. I think the other thing that's just kept me is family is here. And I, I do love it here. I, it's beautiful in the Midwest. And I think people, people like to pretend that it's just all flat and there's nothing gorgeous, but I don't know if I could ever give up Midwestern autumn, or even a day like today. It's I, w I would rather be here than anywhere else. I think. Uh, where Where were you? Where did you live in Mich Michigan? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Uh, where did you live in Michigan? I grew up in Owasso, Michigan, which is between Lansing and Flint. Hmm. And I have family members who live in Flint now in Saginaw. And then I lived in Ann Arbor, where I, I went to the University of Michigan, and then oh, just stayed for a while and worked after I graduated. One of the things I think is so profound is that we watch the news and things seem so far away. Flint, Michigan, and water. Yeah. And Flint, Michigan is here. Mm -hmm. And we're this close to water. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important, part of what you're writing about is our ability as community to change what's happening. We don't have yeah. to stay this way. Things don't have to stay this way. Yeah, I, I'm not going to get too much away about the book's ending, but I, I tried to make it helpful, not helpful, but hopeful, mm -hmm. because you're right, things don't have to stay this way. And I felt like ending the book in any other way, it seems too easy now. Mm -hmm. we, we should want things to change. We should want things to change, Herman. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Uh, what? Um, writers have influenced you? Oh, good question. Oh, I love this question. So, I'm really intimidated by the Octavia Butler comparison, <laughs> but, I mean, who wouldn't be? That's, <laughs> that's wild, but she did influence me. Um, Angela Carter really influenced me, too. I, I love her writing. Um, who else? I mean, I, I could keep listing forever, but especially for this book, I think those two really spoke to me about
how to interweave many different elements and think deeply about this book. Do you read all the time? Yes and no. Like sometimes, sometimes when I'm teaching, well, I'm still reading, but it's a different kind of reading. Mm -hmm. It's reading, it might be even a more generous reading when I'm teaching well and being like a good member of my community because I'm trying really deeply to think about like, what is this person trying to accomplish? How can I help them? How can I be available to them? And sometimes I miss reading just as a reader where I can be like, oh, this is trash. <laughs> I, I don't have to finish this. I'm, I'm in charge of my whole life. I mean, that's my summer reading. It's the pleasure of being able to put a book down and be like, no, I only have a, 15 more years on this planet. I've got to keep going. <laughs> You're stunting my growth book. You're stunting my growth. Yeah. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Okay, I'm sorry. It's your turn and I'm doing what I always do. Oh, back here. Thank you. Here, please. Thank you. Thank you, Odo. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, how long did it take you to write the book? And was there at any point as you were writing that the direction changed from where you thought it was going to be? And where it ended up being? That is a great question, yeah. Olga. Uh, I obviously know many people here. I can say <laughs> your names for me. <laughs> no, I would love it though. It makes me feel intimate. Well, it's true. I know many of these beauties, and I thank you for being here. <laughs> I feel like I'm in your house a little bit. Well, it's you are. Nice. Lucy, Danielle, Jonathan. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. David. <laughs> <laughs> but, so I started it in 2018, and what I, what I always do is when a book it feels really fancy for me to say what I always do, even though I'm always, I'm only on my second book. <laughs> but what I do is after my agent's like, okay, we can have people see this, I, I start the next book because you still never know. I mean, it's part of the writing life. You, you don't know if anyone's gonna wanna buy your book, so you give yourself something else to obsess over. You, you keep working. It, if you're lucky, or sometimes you just spiral out. But most of the time, I, I keep working. And so this started originally in a much different way where it was, it was more about race and how black and white people can interact with each other, where there was this folk tale I was really obsessed with, where it was about a witch who made a much younger woman spit pins. And I had this idea that the book would be about a black woman caught like looking, she, she's a teenager, and she, she's looking like lustfully at a few young men, and an older white woman curses her for in the grocery store so that any time she feels desire or lustful thoughts, she would start spitting pins. Mm -hmm. But that, that is not the book. <laughs> like the only thing that remained is I, I did realize I want to think a lot about desire, and I didn't want to spend so many pages trying to figure out how I can make someone spitting pins like a book that people would actually want to spend 200 pages with rather than just being very gross. <laughs> and I also realized that some of the things I was writing, it, it was the leftovers of the book I'd written before this. And I think that's the other thing that comes with time and experience is you realize that sometimes the thing you start immediately it's the leftovers of the other project that you kind of have to exercise. And there's gonna be like a root left of what you can maybe use, but most of the things you have to be ruthless and cut out and then go to the thing that you actually wanna talk about. Wow. This is so insightful into your process of writing and... Oh, I love talking about writing though. I mean, it's a little embarrassing sometimes to be a writer who says that because Writing is so personal, and it's simultaneously like this professional thing you do, but it's also picking at scabs or being kind of like privately gross sometimes. Like you need it to be both things. It's just it's a balance. Do you feel vulnerable? Oh, all the time. I, I mean, some of it. Oh, I'm such an emotional person. I. <laughs> <laughs> I was freaking out about doing this, and I yesterday I went to the Mall of America for the first time, and then I just started crying in the Texas parking lot, and a bunch and like people, a bunch of people saw me just 
crying. It's Jenny, you saw, I'm fine. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> a bit of overwhelmed, perhaps. <laughs> I was just overwhelmed, and I mean, I, I mean, everything went very poorly with my first book in terms of, the, like, it came out in March 2020, and we we had had some things planned, and I, I didn't, like, sometimes you realize that the impact of things on you, and sometimes you don't, and I realized I, I had bought, like, all these, like, things for book tour for the first time. And then this time I was like, oh, I didn't plan anything. I just assumed, like, two weeks ago when they're like, monkeypox is a national public health emergency, I was like, all right, this one's gone too. We're not going to do anything. I'm on Zoom again. I'll just wear the same three shirts I wore on the last book tour. And then yesterday I was like, oh, I'm going to be in person tomorrow. I'm going to be traveling the next week. And just, like, all right, I guess I have to go to the Mall of America. Like, all that is panic thinking. Yes. No one has to go to the Mall of America on a Monday night. <laughs> <laughs> and be like, what, what's going to make me look fine? Also, this wasn't even from Mall of America. This was just in my closet. It was, I bought stuff, I don't know. The I story mean, of my life. Yeah. Yes. And you walked in and Beverly said, your dress is fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it was for, I made you feel so much better. And I wish I'd known you yesterday and you could have said, don't go to Mall of America. <laughs> questions, but there's something that strikes me, Megan, mm -hmm. that the difficulty you had with your first book, I'm reading in your introduction, one of New York Magazine's top 10 books, NPR Best Book, Michigan Notable Book, finalist for two NAACP Image Awards, finalist for LA Time Books Prize. You didn't know? <laughs> but it's hard to know. I, I'm going to be really frank with you about my mistake. Please. I mean, my, again, we, we got 29 no's before one yes with my first book. I sold my first book for $25,000, and which is still a lot if you come out like short story writing, but in the scheme of like selling a novel, you know instantly that if the press bought your book for $25,000, unless they're a small press, might not Harper Collins, you're not really going to have publicity or marketing. Mm. And the only, and I ended up getting a lot more in-house support than we ever expected, where um, some of the bookstore marketing people, they were like, no, this, we, we, they saw more in the book it felt like than I, than some other people who made more decisions mm. did, and that helped it take off some. And then we were just, and we, I mean, me and my agent, we were really surprised by the awards and the interest in the book because, I mean, we know how things usually go for a book that sells that small and doesn't have a marketing plan. I mean, right now, um, the department, is it the Department of Justice or just United States versus, <coughs> like, Penguin Random House, where Penguin Random House yes. is trying to acquire Simon & Schuster. And I mean, they've been straightforward. If your book, if you're less than $100,000, there's no marketing plan at most of the major publishers for your book. Mm -hmm. There's, maybe people will buy it. That's kind of seemed like the attitude they at least set on the stand. So it's really hard not to be surprised mm -hmm. if you know the industry. I think from outside of it, maybe we, I don't know. Because I think that's the other thing, like you put art out there and if anyone reads it, it's still kind of a surprise. Or if anyone reads it and actually understands you. Because I mean, that's the other thing about writing. You, you have to really accept that people are going to misunderstand you. Even if they like it, you have to get used to hearing multiple misunderstandings of your work all the time. And sometimes misunderstandings can help you, give you a focus on how to revise or think about things. And sometimes it can just be demoralizing. I understand why people stop writing because it's really hard to keep telling people this is what I'm actually saying. Mm -hmm. 
I didn't even know I needed the healing you just gave me. That happens to me on radio. When I'm like, what? <laughs> I totally was not, <laughs> huh? You know, and then when someone gets it, you think to yourself, oh, they got it. Yeah, and it's, it moves your soul a little lighter. Do you believe in soul? It makes you keep going. Yeah. It makes my soul expand. Okay, one more question, babies. Who wants to give it? Who wants to ask it? And I should have said my friend Rob is in the house. I see you too, Rob. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Hennepin County Libraries is all up in here. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Rob. This is wonderful. He has a wonderful question. Also, you're doing a really good job explaining what like teachers do too. When you look at someone, you're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's high praise coming from you, Professor. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Megan, for your time with us this evening. Uh, I have a. Simple to get hard question for you. What gives you hope? People. I, I it's a complicated thing. I hate people. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> but I also love people. I any time where I'm in a situation, I don't know, like I, we were just talking about vulnerability or tenderness, but anytime I'm in a situation where I see someone being just kind to someone and they don't have to be, or they're taking an extra step just to make someone feel welcome, that's one of the most hopeful things I can experience right now. It, and it, I feel like that's so vulnerable and maybe even a little uncool to be like, but it, it's so wonderful to see someone actually want someone to feel well still, or to feel good or welcome. It, it's another thing that just fixes your, it fixes your soul. Or when I feel really hopeless, I try to find a way to help someone else. It, it's also the only thing that makes like writing worth doing to me sometimes when it's really hard to do. It, it's why I keep teaching, because I, I try to find ways so that People can build their careers off mine, especially as a black writer. There's so much space I have to make for other people. There's so many people who, they, it's complicated because I'm frustrated that the system is where my successes help other people's successes, but it is still how publishing does work. And so the more people who buy my books, the more I can say, you know whose book you should buy? This person's book, she's brilliant. Here's a proven track record of a black woman who sold books. Here is my black woman student who is brilliant. Give her a chance too. Part of the beauty of black women, <laughs> black being a culture and not a color, is that we love our people. So we can serve them because we love them. Even when they get on our last nerve, Right? Even when we can barely take it. But community is what saves us. Look at all the names I can call, all the faces I see. We didn't have to come anywhere. That, to me, is what you're talking about. It doesn't all have to stay this way. It doesn't. Megan, before we go, one of the questions we ask of every author on Black Market Read, because everybody wants to know, what are you reading, Megan Giddings? This is coming out in the fall. I think it's late September or early October. It's called Jackal by Erin Adams. Okay. It's, and she is a young black woman and it's her debut book. And it's, it's a horror novel, so if you don't like horror, <laughs> you might. But at the same time, it's also another one about a mother-daughter relationship and about anxiety. And there's also a lot of beautiful writing about the woods and friendship. And I think that might speak to you. Um, what else? I started rereading Ross Days, who you've had on the show. I started rereading Beholding by Ross. Oh. Part of what I think is so beautiful is that he sat here. And now, my dear sister, you're sitting here. And he was my teacher, and he taught me how to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. I just, I think about that. I just, it's incredible. It is so beautiful to be a part of black culture 
to be a part of the opportunity to lift Black voices. Buy her book. Tell everybody you know to buy her book. And tell them to buy every book you can find by Black authors. And remember, <clears throat> when you're talking to the publishing industry, $25,000 and all of these awards, they would never think to give John Grisham $25,000. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And his books, frankly, couldn't stand up. So it's just something to think about. Mm -hmm. Megan, it has been my privilege to host you. And if you go to Beverly's Book Club, I am going to Beverly's house. I'll sit outside, I'm not part of the book club, but I will sit there, I will bring the snacks. I will do whatever it takes to get into that book club. And I already read the book, so I'm straight ahead. <laughs> Her name is Megan Giddings. I want to say thank you to our audience, thank you to our listeners, and most especially, Megan, thank you to you. Thank you to Majors and Quinn for providing this beautiful space for us to be here tonight. And congratulations, Megan. I am certain that if the world catches up and catches on, you're going to win many, many more awards. And I'm so glad that we're going to have you right here at the University of Minnesota teaching our students. That is going to be fantastic. Welcome to Minnesota. Yes. Yeah.